Welcome to Spirit Journey Collective. I'm your host, Sarah Tai. Get ready for compelling conversations with guests of all walks of life who believe they have found their purpose. Together, we will uncover unique backstories, hearing the raw experiences that led them to the work they are doing today. Let's expand our minds together with the captivating stories and inspiration that awaits. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Spirit Journey Collective. I have a really great guest today. Her name is Kate Mariah. She's an intuitive wedding doula, as well as a Reiki master who offers a gentle goddess Reiki. So I want to dive into that too, but especially the intuitive wedding doula that is a new one for me. And so I can't wait to learn all about it. Thank you so much for being here today, Kate. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be part of this wonderful podcast that you offer. Thank you. Yeah, I'm super excited too. I think I asked you months ago and we just had our conflicts and I just, I've, I've known it from the beginning. I'm like, if we get to connect, it's going to be a great conversation. I remember seeing a post about you being a wedding doula a long time ago prior to my podcast. And I was fascinated. Like, what is this? So before we go into all of that, though, why don't we start with, why don't you explain a little bit about what intuitive wedding doula is and, and what you offer as a whole all around? So I am an intuitive wedding doula and a Reiki master, gentle goddess Reiki, like you said. I was a science teacher by trade, and I was born and raised in Boulder, Colorado by a birth doula and a psychotherapist. So I've been sort of in the spiritual wellness world from birth, and now I have these two offerings that really overlap. What I've found is that my Reiki really serves people who are in transition and that the wedding doula piece, we can go into like how that came about and why I call it a doula, but that's a huge life transition, right? (laughs) So the Reiki piece really supports moving through that and gives a deep sense of comfort and stability through a time that we often feel ungrounded and off center and lost and, and stressed out (laughs) really. (laughs) That's awesome. And I, I know that you briefly mentioned the science teacher too. Like that was kind of what you did before you stepped into doing what you do now full time. That is so fascinating. I just have to touch on that because so many people look into like the spiritual realm, especially those that are more science leaning and they will look at us and be like, God, you guys are so woo woo. (laughs) You know, you're so out there. But I've also found listening to other podcasts and reading different books and everything else that science and spirituality is really two sides of the same coin. Right. And a lot of more science is backing up spirituality and vice versa. But I mean, did you have a harder, I know that you also mentioned that you grew up in wellness. So I'm just so curious, how did the science piece like tie into the more spiritual wellness side? Because that's, you'd think being more in the wellness, you would have gone more in the wellness, but it's like you went to the other side. And so I'm super curious about that one. Yes. I'm so glad you asked because it's been an edge for me through my life because I've always had this deeply intuitive side. And as I've now, as I like look back at it from, from this angle, I can see that I was using the scientific method to explore spirituality and my intuition, right? I was like trying things out, testing, seeing what happened, modifying, trying again, validating my results, right? Like, so my science brain was analyzing and like helping me grow down my spirituality path. At the same time, there was like the societal science brain skepticism that was looking at it. And so when I first learned Reiki, I could not, I I was like, this can't be real. Like, I can't be feeling this, this distance Reiki. Now I do distance Reiki and I love it. But it took me several times of working on friends, getting their confirmation that they were like, feeling what I was feeling. And it had to happen over and over and over and over again to finally convince my science brain that like, this is real. (laughs) This is happening. It's powerful. It's meaningful. And sure, science can't necessarily explain it right now. But we also can't measure things that we don't have tools to measure. (laughs) So yeah, it's been it's been a journey. Yeah, so I am more analytical myself, like, even though I've always been drawn to the paranormal things, 
I've always kind of gone into it with this analytical side. So point, just give a, a point or an example. I was a ghost hunter like a decade ago for fun. Mm -hmm. So it was like between like 18 and maybe 22, I actually joined a legit ghost hunting group and we went to legit places and investigated. And I went in with this mindset of, okay, well, I'm here to debunk everything before I believe it's a thing. And I, and I experienced things that I'm just like, oh, I can't, I can't explain that. And I tried. So you know, moving into the more spiritual realm, especially when I started my spiritual journey, which was about four years ago, that's kind of what got me was I started with hypnosis, self-hypnosis. It was a manifestation podcast offered workshops that started with self-hypnosis and healing. And I was like, oh, I can get behind this because this sounds scientific. It doesn't sound woo-woo. It doesn't sound out there. But then I experienced Reiki for the first time. And it, it wasn't a distance, but it was in person. But I just couldn't believe what I felt. And then what she picked up, she didn't know me. We didn't know each other. And yet she was able to pick up certain things that I didn't tell her about. She shouldn't have known. And then I had some incredible experiences, like the next time on the table where I had my own, I guess, I think I met my spirit guides, maybe it was wild. So since then, it really kind of opened me up to like, okay, I'm going to start believing in this other stuff, even though it just sounds a little bit, it does, it sounds a little bit out there, especially coming from that more left brained, this is how it is. <laughs> this is, you know, it's, you know, black and white and the right brain is very creative and intuitive. And we know when you're, when you tap into the right side, you know, that there's things you just can't explain with science. So I just love that you have that duality within you. Cause I can really relate to that. And I always kind of almost trust someone more when they have when they said when they have like that sense of groundedness <laughs> you know what I mean I think it's just me and my own logical side but I do I'm like okay so obviously this person's rooted in their earth to know that maybe some of the things they're talking about isn't acceptable or normal per se but but then they experience something that trusts it and backs it up and then of course being a reader I've struggled with my own validation but just like you I just constant validation that makes me go okay no I know what I'm doing like I really am tapping into my intuition so yeah, yeah. it's definitely a careful balance and what's been really beautiful for me in the last couple of years I've been really like I, I quit science teaching in 2020 got pushed out by COVID but it was like the perfect little nudge right that we lots of us got <laughs> and as I've really sunk into it and been practicing more Reiki I've realized that it's not just Reiki. Like I have, I've taught anatomy and physiology. I know the body from the science perspective, from my own physical experiences. And then I know vibrations. I'm a singer. So I bring in sound and toning. So it's kind of like using singing bowls, but I use my voice so I can access the whole like range of tones and then visualization is such a huge piece i feel like healing of, of imagining and creating change within our bodies and within our lives i mean so i i definitely use reiki but not it's not just normal reiki <laughs> sort of this amalgamation of a whole ton of tools that i've brought together and created this is offering. Yeah, I love that because it, we're not all here to be robots and recreate the same exact experience. So like other Reiki masters and, and um, Reiki practitioners, they're going to show up differently than you are. And because we all have our own gifts. And that is so, so cool. I'm a singer too, but I've never thought about like using my voice to bring in those different tones. And I've, I've worked a little bit with singing bowls but not, yeah, I never thought about using your voice. I want to kind of look into that one because yes. that's really cool. And especially the fact that it started in COVID for you. I cannot tell you, I think almost everyone I've spoken to on my podcast had some kind of a big push from what they were doing before to what they're doing now in COVID. And so I know that, you know, it was such a difficult time. A lot of people lost their lives or lost families. And so I don't want to downplay that at all. But I do feel like there was some bigger energetic shift that was happening because so much has changed. And more people, if they didn't step into their purpose or their calling then, 
it was like the beginning steps that propelled them to start considering it. And, you know, so maybe they're stepping more into it now or they stepped into it a year ago. Right. But it does feel like COVID brought some interesting energy shifts. Yeah. And I mean, I think that the, the loss and the death that we all faced was a piece of it. It's grief. is like a, another big part of my journey. I had six months after my wedding, my father passed and then four years later, my mom died. So the like deep grief and going through that has been a huge part of my personal transformation. My dad died in 2013. So it's like way before COVID. But I think there is some really powerful medicine in facing our mortality <laughs> and looking at it and going, what am I doing with my life? Right. And really starting to turn inwards and look at like, okay, well, what is really meaningful to me? What's going to fill me up? Because we don't, we, we don't live forever. And I think that what you described is there. I think there's, they're interconnected. Yeah, for sure. Especially when it comes to transformations, there's usually some kind of a catalyst. And, and then when you mentioned the wedding, you know, wedding, being a wedding doula and helping people through that transition, it is. It's, it's transformation. There's a life and death thing happening there. And and again, I'm, I'm so first of all, I'm so sorry about the loss of your parents because I I cannot imagine what that is like to to process and go through, especially because I mean you seem very young. So you know usually that's not something you have to worry about till you're much older. But I I can relate a little bit around my wedding in 2013 actually. <laughs> yeah, my my grandpa who was, I really wanted him at the wedding. And, and he, he was starting to, you know, get kind of dementia and deteriorate a little bit. But every time I'd see him for like the whole year leading up to my wedding, he'd look at me and say 11, 12, 13, which was my wedding date. And he mm -hmm. would remember it and he was so excited. And then a week before my wedding, he had a UTI that went, um, sepsis, sepsis. Got sepsis yeah. or yeah. something. Yeah. And he they basically he could have chosen to get like a feeding tube and and he would have been able to live a little longer but if anyone who knew my grandpa knew that going out to eat at restaurants with his friends was just like his life you know with my grandma and everything else and I think he just realized there was no quality in that so he chose not to do it which put him in the hospice and he literally passed the day after my wedding and leading up to it like I knew he was not gonna live for very much longer. So, and he was yeah. like the one person I so wanted to be there. So it was just like, as I'm doing this big transition from going from, you know, being, I mean, granted my my then husband at the time and I, we lived together and we were practically already living like a married life, but it's still, it's a big transition taking the name and signing the, the official, you know, certificate mm -hmm. and, and, and knowing like we're really doing this. It, you know, was a lot between my grandpa and everything else. So, yeah, I mean, it's so interesting when you add grief in that aspect, not even just like what was and what is coming, you know? Yes. And that's what I have come to realize working with more and more, mostly women going through the, the wedding journey is I start out and we start talking about, you know, the stress and the dynamic with your mom and sisters and the pressures and all the decisions. But then we get a little deeper and it's like, oh yeah, my aunt isn't going to be there at the wedding. And she was really meaningful to me, you know? And there's, so there's these really deep layers of grief, whether it's like potent and it's happening right during it. That's a really intense story. I'm so sorry. That's like, oh, how do you do both of those at the same time? But no matter if it was, you know, 10 years ago or it's happening right now, grief we carry with us. And that has probably been my biggest lesson that I have learned through my process with grief. I'll share a little story. My dad passed in December and, you know, they give you like three days of bereavement. I was like, cool, not enough, but okay. And I like go about my life and I'm, I'm dealing with the grief like really well. I'm like meditating every day for like an hour of like self-care and movement and all those, I call it meditating, but it's movement and vocalizing and my own little magic of, of meditation. And I end up 
signing up to go to this retreat for entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs in Kauai. And I sit down in the circle on the first day and we all sit down together and we pull a card for the intention for the trip. And I pulled grief. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my gosh, I thought I was done, right? I was like four months later, like so not done. But it was my first experience with grief. And I pull it and not only is it grief, but the message on there will stick with me for the rest of my life. It was the only way out is through. And that is really a huge piece of what I bring to the wedding doula and the Reiki is that we can't get to the, the lightness and the peace that we're seeking without allowing ourselves to feel the sadness, the anger, the frustration, the everything that comes up because it's grief is not one dimensional for sure. It's got so many sides. And especially for women, that anger piece can be so uncomfortable. It's like never really had to face it in that way before. And it can come out at our partners and in ugly ways if you don't have the tools to really move anger in a physical way. And that's been a huge piece. And it translates into all of the offerings that kind of come back to the only way out is through. Yep. That's, I will say that that's also been a big lesson I've learned with tarot. It's very, very similar. And grief, it's so funny, people will see, see grief and sometimes I'll get, well, I haven't lost anyone close to, like, and I'll tell them, oh, that's, that's well, first of all, that's beautiful. And I'm so glad that you haven't had to experience that yet. Because it I didn't lose my grandpa until I was, like, in my mid-20s. And he was the first person that I was really close with. So I was in my mid-20s before I had to really face grief. But grief covers so many different things, right? It could be an estranged relationship. It could be when you're maybe some people, when they get married, they go from living in separate homes to living in one home, right? Now they have to grieve letting go of their own space. So mm -hmm. there's different levels of grief. And I can definitely see how that would play a part in helping, you know, women go through that transition. So what exactly so why don't you share like more in depth, like what exactly is a wedding doula? And then we can kind of break it down from there, like what you offer, what you do and and how, yeah, and, and how it works. It's so funny because wedding doula, people who know about the word doula get it. They're like, oh, I got a, a doula. Other people are like, are you a bridal assistant or like a, I'm like a wedding planner? I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> So doula, the term doula literally means from Greek female servant, which is a little bit weird, but I actually kind of embrace it because I do feel like serving is the energy that I bring. And the wedding doula is really about holding space, taking care of the physical, emotional, mental, spiritual space for the couple. It's, I usually work with the brides, but that doesn't mean that I can't work with the <laughs> with whoever. And even in a, I have had several lesbian clients too, and I've worked with one of the people <laughs> instead of both of them together. Anyway, so I'm not gonna, like, I will help you make the decision about what tablecloth color you want or whatever, if that's really stressing you out. But probably in the process, I'm going to be guiding you in to check in with your body, listen to what's underneath the stress, because we often externalize our stress onto something that's like really tangible for our minds. But there's deeper level levels and healing that need to be done underneath it. So I do that through one on one sessions, Reiki, and also I call the one on one sessions I call deep listening. So it's kind of like a blend of somatic awareness, talk therapy, and Reiki kind of all blended together. And then I do just, just Reiki. And then I also have a group called Wise Brides where we come together, a whole group of brides. And I love that because the affirmations of being seen by other people in the same place as you is so powerful. I can share all I want, but having another person there being like, yeah, feeling the exact same way, you're not alone, can go a really long way because wedding planning can be really isolating. 
the people that you turn to, to for support are often having their own emotional journeys that make it not as available, make them not as available for your emotional <laughs> journey. And yeah, I, I guess I can share. I have so many stories. The one from my own wedding planning journey is I was using my logic brain, getting everything done, checking things off the list, um, sent out, saved the dates, made the website, right? I was like doing all the things. And right before school started, because I was still teaching, I got a call from the venue saying the venue had canceled and could no longer host. So I was like nine months out from the wedding. I still had time, but I was going into school and teaching is so all consuming. So I could have freaked out and I did, probably did for a couple minutes, but then I was just like, cut, cut it, Kate, calm down, tune in. And what, what do you actually really want? So I like took some deep breaths and I closed my eyes and I was like, where do I envision myself on my wedding day? And then I asked my partner to do the same. And both of us saw trees. He saw pine trees. I saw aspen trees. And we were supposed to be getting married on a farm with like big open spaces, not, not a lot of trees. <laughs> so that helped us like kind of redirect, look for a venue that fit that vision. We found one the next week in our price range of date available, perfect spot, right? And it was that stopping and breathing and like tuning in that helped redirect the whole process. And that's, yeah, that's that's the, the process again and again that spirals through my life of like, okay, I'm doing all the things, I'm keeping everything afloat. And now I don't feel connected to my body at all and I don't know where I'm going. Okay, bringing it back, checking in. So on the wedding day itself, I also support brides, but I, I don't like to just like show up to the wedding. I can do that and I have done that, but I really think the, the work is done leading up to the wedding. So if people hire me for their day of, I'm there ch chatting with them, sending voice memos back and forth, being there to hold them through the whole process, going over the timeline, making sure you've made have had a chance to eat breakfast and are drinking water and I bring all my Reiki things to the wedding day so my rose spritz and my crystals and my palo santo and like all, all my Reiki tools come with me to keep hold energetic space through that transition so you're not looking back and going what just happened <laughs> I love that so while you have like the wedding planner and different people who do different like physical parts of the the wedding you're over here making sure the bride typically just the bride is just because the bride's probably the one that reaches out to you right but you're basically making sure the bride is taking care of herself and making her sure, sure her well-being is okay despite all the moving parts and all the planning and all the things that change and, and i cannot imagine that that you like had to go through losing the venue nine months before i mean you know but and but that happens and you're right like being because I've been a bride you know and it was it was very isolating I mean like I thankfully found a place you know my my you know then husband at the time like we found a um, a place that was a package which was helpful because they they did a lot of the stuff but you know I still had to worry about the dress I still had to worry about we had two dogs that we had on board I had to worry about mm -hmm. like I mean all the the mechanics of it I was trying to make it happen and then you know then there's the you know the potential bridezilla right beforehand you know and I'm pretty proud of myself I don't think I went down that route but there were some moments I totally could have <laughs> And I think and... that that's a natural extension of what we put ourselves through without giving ourselves time to process that change. Because like you said, it, there is a huge letting go. And it's not just, it's not even that tangible of like a name or a, a house. Like there's this letting go of who you were. So the word doula, I, I like to use because the wedding is the birth of a family. So there is this new entity being born that you are now a part of and your single self and like all the most multiplicities of possibilities that you had as a single person are have fallen away. And there is this huge 
stepping into that that symbolizes and that, you know there's always like all the societal and like cultural pieces that are often very sexist you know like the whole institution is like a little uh, demeaning of women so I think that there's probably something in there that maybe could shift it it would feel a little bit more holistic and that that's what I've described it as before is like bringing mindfulness to the wedding journey it's like let's do this in a more a less materialistic and more mindful way yeah so I and I love that because again like there's so much going on for the bride that it's like how do you find you in there? And, and unfortunately, like you said, but women do handle the bulk of the wedding stuff, you know, and the guys just kind of show up. My husband, we separated and then he passed away. So he's no longer oh in the gosh. picture, but, you know, that's why I kept saying my then husband, but, you know, he, I would ask him like, what do you think about this or that? And it was really just like, well, whatever you want, <laughs> which wasn't very helpful. You know, it felt like it all fell on me. The only thing that we agreed on was the color purple. <laughs> was really it the rest of it was kind of like you know he would like the venue we both went we liked it together but again it was more of like the price is right it was a package you know what I mean but the the flowers the colors the like all the things like boarding our dogs and figuring out where we're going it was kind of that was it still kind of all fell on me so you know and so I feel like not to say that the men don't have their own journeys and I almost feel like they need their own support too because there's a lot yeah. going on there but I do feel like the women do need more of that self-care remembrance of yes this is a big day yes there's all these moving parts but you are still needing that care and that tenderness in the middle of it <laughs> you know what I mean so I love that it's time to take a short break from our wonderful speaker are you in the need of guidance around love, career, family, life, or purpose? Embark on a spiritual journey inward with an intuitive tarot reading. Depending on what you're needing and looking for, I offer private one-on-one -on -one sessions as well as personalized email readings. It doesn't matter what the question is. A reading with me provides connection with your higher self, offering curated personal messages or what I like to refer to as spiritual roadmaps, guiding you to the future outcome you desire. Readings are insightful and affordable. If you'd like more information or to schedule a reading with me, please see the link below. What is the main struggle that you see with the brides you work with that you see more often than not? And what's advice you give for that struggle? Oh, expectations. I feel like that might be the the biggest and again all of the lessons for the wedding journey are life lessons which is what I think is so beautiful about this work and what I strive to do in all of what I do it's like the teacher in me <laughs> is I want to, everyone to leave with tools that they use for their lives so it's not just like you come to me when you need help like no you're, you're learning these strategies that support you forever so there's a quote that says all emotional pain comes from unmet expectations. <laughs> and the wedding has so many layers of expectations. There are societal expectations, your own expectations, there's your parents, there's your partners. There, I mean, all of the people that are involved are holding these expectations and they are oftentimes very deep rooted cultural, generational, right? Like there is a lot of deep expectations and when they're not met, there is pain. And it sort of guarantees that there are, is going to be pain in the journey of weddings, unless you do everything exactly as everyone expects, which I just, there's probably some unicorn out there that does that, but like not very often. So it's mean, it's, digging those up, becoming aware of like, oh, I was expecting this. This happened. And then recognizing your own emotional journey through that and being okay with that, accepting. There's the mindfulness strategy of recognize, accept, investigate, and non-identification. It's like a RAIN acronym. So that's, that's the process. I feel like I'm very good at helping people with the recognizing and accepting and getting them on the journey towards, you know, investigating at deeper and getting to a place where they're like, oh, 
this is a reaction that I'm having because of this. And then you can communicate that more clearly to your partner, or your mom or whatever. And then you can also see that in other people and you can be like, oh, wow, they're having this really big reaction to me telling them that like we're having tacos for the dinner. It's not about the tacos, right? It was this expectation that they've been building up in their mind forever and they're having an emotional reaction about their unmet expectation and it has nothing to do with me. And figuring out those boundaries and like that's another piece where the Reiki comes in because energetically we are often intermingled with our family in a really deep way. And so if you can use visualizations and the Reiki energy tools to sort of separate yourself a little bit from what other people are experiencing, and then it's more clear what's really yours, and you can have the space to, to work through that. It's, it's complicated, man. <laughs> Yeah, expectations. I can definitely see that being a big one. Because like you said, there's so many different different versions of what everyone's expecting. But of course, the bride has her because, you know, it's your day. Everyone says it's your day, you know, and then you want to go perfectly and you think you know what it is. And then leading up to it, you want to make sure this happens or this happens. I think one of the best advice I ever got from my mom was, and this was specifically for the wedding day. So, I mean, I definitely could have used a doula for some of the drama that happened leading up to the wedding, but like on the day, my mom said, just enjoy the day for what it is. It's not going to go the way you think it will, but it's it's going to be beautiful if you let it be, right? Which really, really, <laughs> one of the things that happened on the day of was my, I had two bridesmaids. I ended up not having a maid of honor, just to, two bridesmaids. And we, you know, we already had the programs made and everything else one of my bridesmaids got the wrong dress and I did not know until she put it on right like 15 minutes before I was going to walk down the aisle and so our color I mean there's supposed to be multiple colors we just went with one but it was like a plum purple and so my sister had this really pretty long plum purple dress that I picked that my friend was supposed to have and though the dress she got was short and it was like a blue purple very different colors and she the moment she put it on because what happened was she had gone to we, we both went to the same store but she didn't buy it at that store she asked them to put down the number of it and then picked it up at another store and probably never even looked at it again until the day of and then realized oh my gosh she was putting that dress on looking at my sister and then panicking realizing her dress was not the same dress as my sister's and I remember she came up to me and she was like, I'm so sorry. She's like, I don't want to ruin your pictures. I can just sit out. You don't, you know, I don't have to be in it. And I, I had to decide in that moment. And thankfully, I think my mom's words kind of replayed back to me. Like, I have a choice. I don't have to freak out, you know, and I, and I just decided right then in that moment. I was like, no, no, I want you to be in this wedding. I asked you to be in it. I don't want you to not be in it. And so now you're my bridesmaid and my sister's now the maid of honor. <laughs> <laughs> You know, all throughout the day, I was getting people asking me why the dresses were different. And that's just what I said. It didn't match the program or anything, but that's just what, you know, that's just what I did. And so it just didn't kind of look like maybe the program got it wrong. No big deal. No one really keeps the program, you know what I mean? But yeah, so it, when you when you understand that the, that the things that you have in your mind don't often work out that way. So you're then you open yourself up to letting it be whatever it's going to be it does free up so much space to be present and really allow, but it's so hard, especially when it's something like, you know, your wedding day, which most women have been imagining and dreaming about their whole lives. Yeah. And, and that brings up the idea of these like rules about weddings too. Like we, that they all have to be the same color and that people are asking you about that. Like who said that they all have to be the same color? <laughs> like, right? <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> like, right where it, it's not about their dress color. It's about you and love and community. And like, right? We just get lost in those details and what society keeps telling us is what we need to focus on. And then having the support to be able to come back from those mental journeys to come back and be like, okay, how am I doing? So in our Wise Brides group, we always start with Reiki, essentially. We do a Reiki grounding, some stretching, yoga kind of things to just kind of get ourselves back in our body. And that's so important because we just 
our minds can just run away with us anytime. And when we get lost down that path, we can't fully enjoy the moment. And we often make decisions that are not in alignment and we feel, yeah, stressed and bothered. And so every time our group starts and ends, we start and end with visualizations, clearing and somatic stuff. I would say definitely expectations as a whole, even outside of the wedding realm, it, it's huge. And I think that so many, like for me, that's something that I probably in the last year, I've really started noticing expectations versus how it's playing out and realizing that they're never, ever, ever anything close to what we think they will be. And the more you realize that, the more you're able to just hope for the best, right? This is, you know, I want to have a good day. I want to be present. It's not going to work out the way I think it will. And, you know, and being able to incorporate that though into something like the wedding industry is just, there needs to be more of that. Yeah. It's huge for marriages too, like what you expect from your partner. That came up a ton when I had my first kid. And then parenting too, of like what you expect your child to be doing and what's like developmentally really appropriate to expect. And yeah. there's so much. Yeah. So from here, I would love to shift to what I like to call synchronicity story time. It's like my favorite segment because we get to basically talk about the magical side of the world where things just happen, where you can't explain it. Do you have any fun synchronicity stories up your sleeve that you could share? It's so funny because in preparing for this, I was trying to, to think through them. And it's like, I've always been in conversation with the synchronicities, sort of, like, my mother would always ask the parking angels for help finding a parking <laughs> a parking spot or like she'd pick up the phone and say, oh, I knew it was going to be you, right? Like there's those intuitive things that just seem to happen throughout our lives. And I think the big, and there are definitely moments of like, I let this go and created space in my life. And then this perfect thing came in, right? Like that's happened several times in my life too. And my logic brain always likes to try and explain those, <laughs> explain those things away, right? I think the biggest synchronicity piece that I keep revisiting right now is just the client Reiki experiences of meeting people where they are and checking in with their bodies and like, giving messages to them without necessarily knowing their whole story and having that affirmed back in, oh my gosh, like this just happened X, Y, Z. And I'm like, oh, that was the perfect thing for message to come through for you. I'm sure you see that in your tarot too, right? You're like, and here it is. So yeah, I think that's my synchronicity story is just the magic of being in that space with another person and sharing sharing that natural wisdom that's in every one of us and knowing that having that affirmed by someone else is a really powerful experience. Yeah. Yeah. I can definitely relate to that one. That's something that I would say, I mean, I have different synchronicity stories that are like, whoa, you know, I do have those, but the most frequent ones are, are just what you exactly described is usually I'll go into a reading, whether it's, the email ones are the ones that, uh, that still blow my mind. I've learned, I've just learned to trust it. I'm like, I know I never see these people. It's kind of probably similar to how you do distance possibly. But with my, my email readings, I never see them. We never interact. It's usually just a, you know, a question that's sent to me. And then I sit with it. I tap in, I pull my cards and then I, I do a voice recording. And over and over and over again, I'll have the person respond back and, and tell me how well it resonated and how it was exactly what they needed here. And it was spot on and everything going on in their life. And to me, that is definitely a synchronicity because it's like, I can't tell you how many times I send off the email and I'm holding my breath. And sometimes they don't respond at all. And that's fine too, because I've also told myself, because I get two clarif clarifier questions and I'm told myself too, like, if there's an issue, if it didn't resonate, if they hated it, if they have a ton of questions, they know they can respond back. And if they don't, that, that means they just don't have any questions. Not everyone needs to validate it, right? So, but when I do get those validations back, it's just like, yeah, this is this is what I'm supposed to be doing. You know what I mean? And and then it, it does, it reaffirms. It's magical because how, how did I, how did I tap into that? 
how could I have, you know, and it's not me, I, probably similar to you. I feel like I'm just tapping into spirit, spirits coming, you know, it's, I'm the conduit and I'm sure you yeah. see it that way too, you know, but it's still that reaffirming of, I just connected with another human being without the typical kind of connections that make sense. <laughs> yeah. And for me, that's like the most fulfilling thing. I, I, another question that was on here was just like, is this your purpose? And like 100% yes like I there's nothing that makes my heart more happy and full and satisfied than supporting people in this way and it's it's a big shift because I've been helping people for my whole life through teaching and stuff but you're so tapping into this type of work in the science classroom just didn't quite fit yeah because then you have standards and <laughs> you have to do it by someone else's agenda. And of course, science can be very rigid and black and white when there's a whole more intuitive side that you can't explain, but it's, you know, you're able to tap into something deeper, right? Yeah. And thank you for for that comment too, because purpose was on my list here, but I think with our conversation, it just kind of, you know, <laughs> all over the place. But yeah, that is one of the questions I'd love to ask is, is purpose and why, and you totally explain that beautifully. I can relate so much on my own end with why I do what I do too. Do you, the final question I love to ask everyone is, do you believe that everyone else is here with a purpose as well? Yes. So I like to think that everyone's journey is their purpose. So like, because I think that there's a, a little bit of judgment that can come in when we say like, you're not living your purpose or like self judgment of like, oh, I should be doing something else or so I 100% think that everyone has gifts, unique, beautiful gifts to share with the world. And the struggle, the grief, the getting lost, the not all those who wander are lost, right? That was, that was a bumper sticker on my car in high school. Like you have to wander and experience those extremes to find the center. So for anyone listening that's like on a journey and you don't think you know where you're going, like, yeah, you do know where you're going. And this is part of it is feeling lost and going through this hard time. Yeah, it reminds me of a quote I've heard before that says, turning your pain into purpose. <laughs> That's kind of similar, but yeah, 100%. I don't like to like say that purpose is like this grandiose big thing because it could be a number of different things, but I think it's ultimately finding yourself and tapping into your gifts. Because like you said, I love that you pointed that out. We all have gifts. We all have things that we bring to this world in the way only that we can do. And that, I think finding that is is really like our journey but through that like you said it's you you go through multiple heroes journeys right you go through multiple transformations what you think your gifts are now might shift into something else so being able to understand that it's more about really being so in tune with yourself so now that, we, that now that you can connect more with others and help others you know it's but you have to take the journey and you have to and I love the the quote not all who wonder are lost is that John Muir? I think Maybe I not. think that not all who wander are lost is from The Hobbit. <laughs> oh, really? No way. I didn't At least know that's that. where I have it in my brain. Is my, my dad was a huge, huge it made me think. Tolkien. Yeah, so. I wonder. Yeah, I, I thought maybe it was a John. I think it's John Muir. Muir. He's like a big person who like did a lot of nature yeah. stuff. But I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I I'll mean, either way, it's a great quote. <laughs> So if anyone wants to work with you, whether they're looking for Reiki or they're looking for a doula to help them throughout their process, getting, you know, getting married and, and starting that whole thing, how can they find you? Yeah. So I have a website it's called yourweddingdoula.com and I have two social medias. I've got in Instagram, which has a separate one for intuitive wedding doula. It's just intuitive.wedding.doula. And gentle goddess Reiki. So I have two, one for each one on both Instagram and Facebook. So you can find me in all of those places. I have taken a little bit of a step back from social media. I'm re aligning myself with how I'm going to engage with social media, my website and just setting up a connection call. I offer free connection calls where we can just chat and I can offer you free tools for wherever you're at and you can 
you know, take that with you in this moment and then kind of sit with it and decide when you need support. Because sometimes we just need to touch base before diving into those things. There's a, there's a time and a place for doing the energetic work. And I fully respect and trust everybody to make those decisions for themselves. I love that. That's, that's a great point too. Cause some, sometimes you find people in the service industry who swear they're the only ones and they're the only ones that can help you. And I'm not about that either. It's more like, if you feel drawn to me, if, if what I'm offering can help you, that's totally your call. And that's your discernment and your right to make that decision. Even in readings, I'll, I won't tell them any, I never tell anyone what to do. I always say, this is the energy around this and this is the energy around that, you know? And so I love that. That's not, there's no pressure. It's if you feel like we're a good fit, I'd love to work with you, right? Yeah. So yeah, if, if anyone does want to work with Kate, the links are in the show notes below so you can find her quickly and easily. And thank you so much for, for being here. I mean, I know it took a little bit for us to connect, but this conversation was so awesome and wonderful. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate your time and this space for having these conversations. The process is messy and we don't often talk about it. And I really appreciate that you bring that out for everybody to see. Thank you so much. That means a lot. <laughs> awesome. Right. Bye everyone. Thank you for joining me on another inspiring episode. Remember, your purpose is a unique and unfolding path. I hope these conversations have ignited a spark within you. Until next time, keep exploring, growing, and embracing the beautiful adventure of connecting with your purpose. Stay tuned for more meaningful conversations. If you enjoyed the episode today, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And thank you for joining me on this journey.